So today we're going to talk about um, makeup and the field of artistry is a very real segment of cosmetology. The makeup application techniques vary slightly as the skin types and personalities of your clients. The goal of effective makeup application is to enhance the client's individuality rather than making or rather than offering a makeover based on some ideal standard. So everybody has a personality, they have personal choices, lifestyle that goes into their choices of what type of makeup, what type of look they like to wear. So foundations are tinted cosmetics that are also known as base makeup, and these are used to cover even out skin coloring, conceal minor imperfections of the skin, and protect the skin from climate, dirt, and debris. They're available in liquid stick and cream forms, and primer, which is used under the makeup, helps to disguise less than perfect skin. So it's even in primer, evens out your canvas. It kind of fills in um, your pores, and, and you know if you've got shallow scars, so your makeup will make, uh, lay more evenly over your skin. It keeps your makeup from sucking the moisturizer out of your face, and it helps your makeup to last longer. So liquid foundations are water-based with emollients, oil-free, these are for oilier skin, and then cream-based or oil-based and they are thicker than liquid. Um, they provide a heavier coverage with your cream base and they're also usually intended for dry skin types. They're not recommended for active acne skin. So we wanna read the labels on our oil-free to make sure that it is indeed tested to be non-communogenic for oily and acne prone skin. And then the liquid makeup, um, it's made up of water mostly, and it may have some emollients such as mineral oil or silicone. Um, and this mixture of oil and water helps apply the makeup color agents evenly. Concealers, these are gonna help to hide dark circles. They're going to cover blemishes and discolorations, and these are available in tins, jars, or tubes with wands, uh, liquid, cream, stick. Base powders, these are going to add a matte finish, absorb oil, and set your foundation. They can come loose or pressed. They're a mixture of talc or cornstarch and pigment, and not all powders are matte. You can find some that, you know, add some luminosity, some that maybe have some shimmer, um, just depending on your preference. The shimmering, um, if it's got any type of iridescence, if you have older, more mature skin, it's going to accentuate your lines and wrinkles. So eyeshadows can accentuate your eye shape. They complement your eye color. And our law of color that we learned with hair coloring can apply to um, selecting colors for um, cosmetics also. Eyeliner is used to define the eyes. It can make it can make the lash line appear fuller. You know, some people like a thicker line with a flick, or some people go full cat eye. Some people just want a thin line. Um, so there's pencils, there's liquids, there's felt tips. Um, there's an array of selection out there. You just have to find the one that works best for whatever particular eyeliner style you're wanting to apply. You know, some are going to work better with your cat eyes or your your uh, little kitten flicks um, more so than, you know, maybe a pencil would because pencils can tend to lay a little thicker. So you have to find what works for you. Your eyebrow color. All right, this is used to add color and contour brows, and it's available in pencil and powder. And now in a kind of semi-liquid, you know, with mascara applicator, um, they should not harshly contrast with your hair color, so maybe two shades deeper than your natural hair color, otherwise it can look really harsh. Cheek colors, also called blush or rouge, and these come in powder, gel, or cream, and the application should look soft and natural. You know, we don't want it too heavy, too bold. It should look like it's coming from within. Um, some people may want to go a little bit more dramatic, but, you know, everything in moderation. You don't want to be really fair and have flaming red blush on your cheeks. So stay within your complementary colors. 
Lipstick or glosses, these formulas are um, of oil, wax, and dyes. They're used to enhance or correct the shape of the lip. Lip liner is used to outline the lips and it can keep the color from feathering. Um, they're available in many color and forms. Uh, you also want to consider the client's preferences. Eye color, skin tone, and lip shape do not apply directly from the container. You can use a spatula to remove the color from the container and take it from the spatula with a disposable lip brush. This is if you're doing multiple clients, you know, of course your your own personal, you would not have to to go to that extreme. But if you're gonna have a line in your shop or salon, you want to make sure that you've got disposable tools that you're using or tools that can be cleaned and disinfected um, because we don't want to spread any disease or germs to person to person. So the lip liner is going to help kind of correct your shape. Um, it also contains waxes that can keep your color from bleeding outside your lip line. Red, some reds tend to have a, a tendency to really bleed. Um, it also keeps, um, it can coordinate with your lip color so that, you know, when your lipstick wears off a little bit, that lip liner is a little waxier, so you'll still have some color to your lip until you can reapply. And these should be sharpened and sanitized before every use. You can sharpen them, you know, with your pencil sharpener um, tool, and you want to make sure that you're cleaning that out with um, a Q-tip or something with alcohol on it. Um, and you want to make sure, you know, that you can lightly spray the tip of the lip liner um, with alcohol and then twist it in the sharpener to clean it off and have it ready for the next person. Mascaras, um, these are used to darken and thicken lashes. They're a polymer product. They include water, wax, thickeners, film formers, and preservatives. Some contain lengthening fibers. Some now are containing... Um, active ingredients that help to stimulate lash growth. Uh, you know, mascaras differ from brand to brand, formula to formula. You can find one that you like and works for you. I'm still, I'm always looking for my holy grail of mascara. I love to try different mascaras. And one of the things, you know, sometimes, you know, if you pump it too much with air, you really just want to push your wand in and pull it out. You don't want to pump it because you're pushing air into the tube. That can cause your mascara to dry out quicker. Um, if you feel like your mascara is getting dry too soon, you can um, have a cup of really warm water, not boiling, and you can just place the tube in a glass with that water closed for, a, you know, a couple of minutes and pull it out, and that, the heat from the water will help to loosen up what may have dried up in there. You can also use sterile eye drops um, and put a couple of drops in there to help extend. Mascara should be replaced every three to six months. It builds bacteria up in it really quick. Um, you know, we have bacteria that lives on us and we have it that lives on our lashes. So that, you know, wand to lash over a period of time, the bacteria will start building up. If you experience any eye infections, any pink eye, anything you've used around your eye, you need to dispose of and replace with the new product. Other cosmetics include eye makeup removers, grease paint. This is theatrical, heavy makeup and can, uh, cake or pancake makeup. This is a solid mask that you can use. Uh, usually would wet the sponge. Uh, you may be able to use some dry. I think the pancake makeups have kind of gotten replaced with more of the powder foundations that you can use wet or dry. But um, I remember my mother having a, a container of Max Factor, which was a cake pancake makeup. So makeup brush, brushes and other tools, um, the hair, this is the term for the bristles. Bristles can be made from animal hair. They can be synthetic. And I think, you know, some of your PETA uh, people, um, animal activists are pushing more toward the synthetic. The ferrule, this is the metal part that holds the brush intact and it supports the strength of the bristles. The handle, of course, these come in a wide range of lengths and styles and can be made from wood, acrylic, plastic, metal. Um, gently cleanse your brushes with an antibacterial detergent followed by a commercial cleaning solution. You need to clean your brushes regularly. Um, if you've got some that you use more frequently every two weeks, but at least once a month. 
and they make quick clean sprays that you can spray on a tissue or paper towel to kind of quick clean in between because even brushes that you just have sitting out maybe on your counter counter or your makeup table you know they can accumulate dust and we've discussed what dust is made of it's human skin cells that have been shedded so you don't want to be pushing that around on your face so you do need to make sure you are cleaning your brushes and we're going to hold these with the bristles down toward the sink we're not going to point the bristles up into the water stream we don't want the water getting saturated behind that ferrule or the glue is that can cause them to loosen and brushes don't last forever you know if they're starting to show signs of wear and tear bristles are coming out it's time to trash them and replace them so once you um shampoo them you want to rinse them well again with the bristles facing down squeeze out the excess water and then you lay them flat to dry you can also um, rub them onto a towel a clean towel to help remove some of the excess moisture and this will help them to dry faster so some of the makeup brushes that you will find are powder brushes a blush brush concealer brush lip brush eyeshadow brushes eyeliner angle lash comb brow brush tweezers an eyelash curler and a pencil sharpener single-use implements are going to be sponges powder puffs mascara wands spatulas disposable lip brushes spun tipped shadow applicators cotton swabs cotton pads or puffs and some of these fabric powdered puffs or the sponge ones you also need to clean those so you're going to want to shampoo them um, with an antibacterial soap rinse them really well squeeze them and um, lay them flat to dry those of you with oily skin you may notice if you're using a, a powder compact that the powder will darken and kind of get hardened on top this is because it's absorbed the oil so that little plastic film between your product and your powder puff or your sponge you need to keep that to keep your product from absorbing any oil that's on your applicator and of course as I said you need to clean those regularly you can take a you know like a butter knife and scrape that top dark hard layer off your powder um, to get to the fresh product uh, product that's underneath it um, <clears throat> so when we're doing makeup on clients again we want disposable implements or we want things that can be cleaned and disinfected and these items are some things that you know of course can are single use and you can dispose of them so how to use color theory for makeup application again we we're dealing with warm and cool colors um, these are the basis from all makeup application there are three factors to consider when you're choosing colors for a client their skin color their eye color and their hair color so you can see there's a chart here you know for fair you know if they're warm they're going to have yellow gold pale peach undertones if they're cool they're going to be pink or slightly red um, medium they can and the warm tones they can have a yellow yellow orange red undertone um, olive is more cool it's going to be yellow green and then of course deeper skin tones can have a red base that can be orange brown red brown or if they're cooler they can be dark olive blue or blue black and of course we have neutral in between those warms where uh, even in the fair medium and dark ranges neutrals can go you know a little bit warm or they can go a little bit cool or they can be just right in the middle so you can you know switch it up just a little bit so pairing warm and cool colors is not recommended the colors will compete with each other and result in an unbalanced appearance so if you're doing cool blush and a cool eyeshadow your lip needs to be cool if you're doing a warmer eye you know a warmer blush then you need a warmer lip um, when applying makeup I always remember to analyze the client the client's skin type and choose the makeup that will enhance their skin tone eye and hair color as well as their features once you have determined the skin is fair medium or deep you may choose eye cheek and lip products select colors to match the skin tone and level or try to contrast for more impact most skin tones are complemented by a wide range of colors 
Be cautious when choosing lip, cheek, and eye colors for deep tones. Light or flesh tone shades without enough blue pigment will appear gray or chalky on the skin. So neutrals are the safest. Um, you know, most of the time for my day look, I wear a lot of neutrals. Um, so for the blue eyes, they say we can go into the orange, gold, peach range, copper, mauve, plum, taupe, and, and uh, camel. I tend to stay more to neutral to cool. Occasionally, you know, I will go a little warm. You have to be careful with blue eyes and copper because if there's too much red in it. It makes our eyes look tired. Um, green eyes, they can do brown-based reds, orange, red, red, violet, violet, coppers, rust, pinks, plums, mauves, purples. Brown eyes, they can wear anything. Um, green, blue, gray, silver. I love to see blues, blue eye shadows with the, the brown eyes. I think that's really pretty, particularly with a woman um, that has a darker complexion. So cheek and lip color, um, you want to coordinate in the same family as the eye makeup. And hair and eye color, coordination of hair and eye makeup and eye color with your eye makeup should be taken into account. So here's some hair color and eye color um, examples. So blonde hair, it can be warm. It can have more yellow or more um, orange. Or if it's cool, it can be more white blonde or ashed. Red hair, it can be gold, copper, orange, or red, or it can be red, violet, or violet, which is your cooler side of your red. Because not one red fits all, not one blonde fits all, as we talked about in hair color. Um, dark brown or black hair, copper red, or your cools would be your violet and your blues. So mature skin, you know, older clients that may have an uneven textured skin due to wrinkles or sun damage, you know, we don't want to do a lot of shimmer, glitter, or frosted colors because they can accentuate dry patches or wrinkles. Um, I still feel safe with a little bit of shimmer on my eye. On, I, you know, I don't do like glitter, glitter. But mature women can still have a little bit of a subtle shimmer, you know, and it depends on, you know, the appearance of their aging. You know, you can just gauge if someone's, you know, got deeper wrinkles under the eyes and that kind of thing, you know, you don't want to get real shimmery. Um, and keep things a little bit more matte, like moist matte, not dry matte with mature skin. You can also have a little something, you know, a primer or a foundation that, you know, provides more luminosity um, because nobody wants to look like that dried, powdered look. So um, altering face shapes with highlight and contour. Highlight and contour is just like Highlights and low lights. Lightness brings it forward, darkness recedes it. So if there's an area on the face we want to push back, like under the cheekbone, if somebody doesn't have really prominent cheekbones, to make it look just a little hollowed out, that's where your contour is going to come into place. You know, if you want to bring something more forward, like your brow bone right above your um, eyelid and under your eyebrow, you know, highlighters can help to accentuate that and bring it forward. So analyzing the face shape, of course, oval we know is the most preferred um, face shape. It's artistically ideal in its proportions and features. The face is divided into three equal horizontal sections. The first is measured from the hairline to the top of the brows. The second is measured from the top of the eyebrows to the end of the nose. And the last third is measured from the end of the nose to the bottom of the chin. And this oval face is a approximately three-fourths as wide as it is long and the distance between the eyes is the width of one eye. So this is what photographers are looking for um, for models when it comes to photographing are these proportions and these balances and symmetries in their face. So I know we've seen some models that you know we if they ever appear without makeup on we're like oh my gosh you know she's really not a stunner but of course you know once they put her makeup on and her hair's done and the symmetry of her face makes her photograph beautifully so a round face of course is broader in proportion to its length 
We have a rounding chin and hairline, and we can apply corrective makeup to slenderize and lengthen the face. So you can see here where they've shadowed her because what they're trying to do is create length and take away from the roundness. So that's going to kind of recess that area in, you know, to narrow it in a little bit and make it look a little bit more angular. Um, square face shapes. Um, these have a wide forehead and a square jaw. So we'd want to apply corrective makeup to offset the squareness and soften the hard lines of the face. So we can do a little contour to round it off. Um, do a little highlight to kind of bring some features forward to take away from the square. Um, triangular face. Again, we're going to shadow to narrow that wider area because um, you, you can see if you come straight across here and down and down, um, that's a triangular face. So we want to narrow that broader area because the jaw is wider than the forehead. So we want to recess this in. Heart shaped, um, you know, the forehead has a wide forehead and a narrow pointed chin. So we want to um, balance the wideness of this with the rest of the face. So we're shadowing to shave off some of the width of that face. And of course, you know, the contour is not going to be, you know, as prominent as what they're showing here. You know, you have to blend it in and it has to be within their tone range. Um, there are bronzers and contours that are made for lighter, medium and dark skin. You know, you don't want to go with the darkest one you can find because it'll just like dirt. It'll look like dirt. So here, a diamond face, she's going to have a narrow forehead and she has the greatest width across the cheekbones. So we're going to come in with a contour to take the width away from those cheekbones and to make the face more symmetry. An oblong face um, has more length in proportion to its width, width um, more so than the square or the round. It's long and narrow. So we're going to apply corrective makeup to create the illusion of width across the cheekbones, making the face appear shorter. So we're wanting to take away from the longness. Um, somebody has, you know, a low forehead or a high forehead or protruding. Um, so that we want to kind of do a shade or two darker to kind of push the forehead back from the rest of the face. So we're going to use a little bit darker foundation, or you can use a contour powder. Um, but they have a larger protruding nose, a short and flat nose or broad nose. For the protruding nose, we're going to apply a darker foundation along the sides of the nose as here. For a small flat nose, we're going to apply a lighter foundation down the center of the nose. Because remember, lightness brings things forward and for a broad nose we would use a darker foundation along the sides of the nose and nostrils to thin it down. Um, if you have someone with a protruding chin and a, a receding nose or a receding chin or a sagging double chin, for the protruding chin we're going to minimize with a darker foundation. Um, so you can see here where they shaded it with a darker foundation. For a receding chin, we're going to use the highlighter or a lighter foundation to bring it forward. If their chin looks more pushed back than the rest of their profile, we want to use that lightness to bring it forward. And then for a sagging double chin, we can use, again, darker foundation to recess and push that area back. So broad jaw, um, jaw lines or narrow jaw lines, jaw lines, we're going to use a darker shade to narrow the jawline if it's really broad. If it's really narrow, we're going to use a lighter foundation to help bring it more forward and add to some of the width and the narrowness of the face. So altering eye shapes. With round eyes, we're going to lengthen by extending the shadow beyond the outer corner of the eyes. 
to take away from the roundness. So we're going to come out to add a little angle and some length here off the corner of the eyes. Close set eyes, we're going to, um, close set eyes are closer together than one length of the eye. So we're going to lightly apply a shadow from the upper edge of the eyes. So we're going to use lightness in here to make it that the eyes look further spaced apart. We don't want to use darkness in this area. We can come out here with the dark in that area, but not in here because it would draw the eyes closer together. Um, this can be minimized by blending the deeper color shadow over the prominent part of the upper lid. Now here we're talking about bulging or protruding eyes. I call them Diana Ross eyes and I love Diana Ross. I think she's a beautiful woman, but she has bulging eyelids. So you're going to use darker shadows to help make that area appear recessed. And then you're going to blend the color from the outer corners inward toward the center carrying it just past the creases. Hooded eyes. This is a particular problem as we age. As you can see, she's got, you know, some overlap of the skin here. Uh, it's called um, ptosis. Um, you need to apply shadow evenly and lightly across the um, lid from the edge of the eyelash line to the small crease in the eye socket. So we're going to use lightness to help kind of make the, the lid portion come forward and take away from this heaviness. So creative makeup again for more eyes. If you have small eyes, we want to make them appear larger by extending the shadow slightly above and beyond and below the eyes. Um, if we have wide set eyes, we want to apply the shadow on the inner side of the eyelid toward the nose and blend carefully. So here we're going to use probably a little bit darker to narrow that space between the eyes. Um, deep set eyes. We want to use bright light reflective colors to help again bring the eye forward um, and be very sparingly. And also with dark circles under the eyes, we're going to apply a color correcting concealer. So here's um, the chart we talked about with the eyebrows, how you can um, draw the lines or the map to shape someone's eyebrow. Um, you know, it should end, you know, when if you lay a pencil right here from the tip up the side of the nose, because sometimes we tend to take the brows a little bit too far inward from tweezing or waxing. They really need to be extended out a little bit further. We're going to come right outside that iris here. This is where the arch should stop, start. And then, of course, the end should land right here off the corner of the eye. And again, you can use a pencil, you know, to get your angle and just um, lay it and then take your little eyebrow pencil and just make little checks in these areas to where you need to shape. Um, of course, nobody's eyebrows are perfect, so that's where your brow pencils and powders come in so you can fill in those areas and extend where you need to. So if we have a low forehead. Um, a low arch gives more height to the forehead. If we have wide set eyes, eyes can look closer by bringing the brows more inward. Um, round face, arch the brows high to make the, the face appear more narrower. And a long face, you want to make the brows almost straight to create the illusion of a shorter face. And a square face, we're going to create a high arch on the ends of the eyebrows to make the face more oval. So these are some um, tips and techniques to shape the brow to help do some uh, facial correcting. Um, lash enhancers and lengtheners contain fibers to make the lashes look longer and fuller. So they're a little... Um, fibers within the um, mascara itself that will deposit as you brush it on. I have tried some of these products in the past. I had one that the little fibers got in my eyes and created a problem. Um, so just, you know, do your research, read reviews, you know, be an educated consumer. Lastice is a product containing uh, Brimatoprose 
and it shows a difference in two to four months. Um, this helps to stimulate lash growth. Latisse is a brand. There are other brands that have this active ingredient in it and prices can vary. So with lips, we have a chart here that's going to kind of show you um, some lining techniques to help correct lips. Um, and I can let you um, read over that. Um, but lips are usually proportioned so that the curves or the peaks of the upper lip fall in directly in line with the nostrils. Um, so here's some more shapes and tricks and tips to um, help you correct lip shapes. Here we go. Now I can enlarge it. I couldn't see my other one. So here, you know, you see we're, we're trying to add some width. Here we might have small lips that we want to make them appear bigger. Now you don't want to come way outside a lip. You know, you need to stay, you know, in proportion with the lip line so it looks natural. Um, you know, small mouths, drooping corners. You can see, you know, these corners turned down can make us look frowny. Here the lip shape is uneven. You know, it's, it's asymmetrical, so it's not the same on each side. So it's showing you a method to correct it. Here, you know, we've got really um, thin upper and lower lips, so we're going to try to make them look bigger. Large lips, you're going to come a little bit inside to try to make them look fuller. And lighter lip colors are going to make the lips look fuller. Darker can make your lips look smaller. Of course, glosses can make lips look fuller. You know, anything that's shiny can make them appear fuller. So if you have already really thin lips, you really don't want to be wearing the dark lipsticks. You know, you might can do a darker lip liner and do, and do a lighter gloss, you know, inside the liner, you know, to help create a more pouty lip. Um, but just keep that in mind. And particularly as we age and our lips do thin naturally, um, it might not be a good idea to wear that maroon lipstick that maybe you were able to pull off when you were in your 20s. So skin tones, you know, we can have ruddy skin and it can look red and wind burned. Um, it can be affected by rosacea. So yellows and greens are going to counter correct redness. And of course, you know, we would apply those color correctors first. They can be in a stick, they can be in a liquid, um, they can come in a primer, there are color primers. And then you would apply your foundation over those particular color correcting primers or concealers or ca uh, camouflages um, to help disguise that readiness. Sallow skin, that's one that can have a yellowish hue. So we'd want to use a pink or even like a violet um, based product on those type of skins. Um, there's primers, again, there's sticks, there's foundations. I'm not a, you know, unless somebody is just like really, really that porcelain like skin, I'm not a big fan of pink based foundations. I would tend to go more neutral and use a color corrector underneath, um, particularly on older women that I've seen that wear a base, a pink based foundation, they tend to look dead to me. So just be careful, you know, using the pink based foundations. I think there are very few people that really wear a true pink based foundation. Most of us have, you know, a little bit, you know, of yellow to our skin and in our fairer um, complexions. So steps for a basic makeup application. And again, this can vary from individual, you know, this procedure is um, just a suggestion. Some people may do more, some people may do less. You need to find what works for you, or if you have clients, you find what works for them. So again, this is just suggested. Client cons uh, consultations, you wanna make sure you have adequate lighting. Lighting makes a difference. This is one of the things that kind of aggravates me in our Ultas and Sephora's is the lighting can be poor, um, particularly when you're trying to match a foundation. Um, you want to gather information. You want to know about their skin conditions, how much or how little they wear. You know, is this special occasion versus just a day look? 
um, amount of time spent applying, color likes and dislikes, and any trouble areas. Not every woman wants to spend an hour, an hour and a half on a routine. Some women, you know, they want to be out the door, you know, in 20 minutes. So you need to find products and um, speed of application that can do the do what they want them to do, but get them out the door quick. Um, so make sure you keep that in mind when you're speaking with the client, their lifestyle, because if she's a real sporty type, she's not going to do 20 steps every morning to do a makeup application. So as a professional, you should know when you can kind of tone it down or find shortcuts, but still have them produce a good result. So applying foundation, we need to match it to their skin tone. You can see this one looks like it has a lot of pink in it. Um, you know, this one's got um, more orange in it. So every makeup has undertones. So we want to make sure we match it to their exact skin tone. If it's too light, you'll appear, you'll will appear chalky or gray. If it's too dark, you'll look dirty or muddy. So we determine the correct foundation color by applying a stripe of color to clean skin on the jawline and blend slightly. If the color disappears on the skin, it is the correct tone because you have to remember, you know, you're matching the foundation also to your neck and your decollete. So your skin may be really fair and maybe you were religious with your sunscreen, but you weren't on your neck and chest and they be, may be a little darker. They may have a little redness in it. Um, which a lot of people will bring their makeup down on, all the way down on to their chest. So make sure you're taking that in consideration because we don't have, a, we don't want to have a really fair light looking face or we don't want to have, um, you know, a tan looking face and then they've got deeper tones as we move down. We've got to try to, blend this together but once you apply on the neck if it disappears into the skin um, that's your tone so you want to blend with a disposable makeup sponge if you're using client from going from client to client of course you know your own personal use you use your application preference and avoid a line of demarcation demarcation is when we see a visible line between the, the jawline and the neck if it's too light, if it's too dark, we don't want to see a line, you know, where we can see where the makeup ends and the rest of your skin begins. So some steps for basic makeup application. We want to, um, of course, we're going to prep the skin. We're going to make sure we have clean skin. It's going to be moisturized. You know, if we have any serums and we're doing, that would go on before your moisturizer. Your moisturizer goes on top. If you're going to do a primer, that's going to go on top of your moisturizer before you put your foundation on. So we want to make sure with uh, concealer, we want to make sure the color is no more than two shades lighter. If we're going to apply powder, we want to apply loose powder with a large powder brush or a disposable puff. So what you want to do with the large powder brush is, you know, you're going to work the powder into it. You're going to tap it on the edge of the container and we're not going to swirl it all over our face. We're going to touch and tap. We're touching and tapping to help set our makeup eyebrow pencils. Um, we're going to sharpen the eyebrow pencil and wipe with a clean tissue before each use. If we're using eyebrow powder, we're going to make sure we scrape the powder from the container onto a palette or tissue and then use a clean angle brush filling the brows with the same technique used when applying a pencil. They're referring to an eyebrow pencil. Eyeshadow is used to highlight um, or to accent certain areas such as the brow bone. It's because remember lightness is going to bring it forward. Use a base color close to the skin tone across the entire eye because, you know, a lot of times we have discoloration over our lids. We may have veins that may look red or blue. So we want to make sure we use a product to even out the skin tone on our eyelids too. And a lot of people would just use their foundation. There are eye makeup bases out there that are um, different flesh tones. Um, you will find what works for you and your client. Shadows, um, you know, we're going to use 
them in accordance with skin tone and hair color. We're going to use darker colors to contour the crease. We're going to minimize puffiness or define the lash line. Um, eyeliners, you need to be extremely cautious. We don't want to have eyeliner that covers half of our lid. You know, so make sure, you know, if you're limited on space, you know, then you're using eyeliner accordingly. Eyeliner is to make the lash line look thicker and it's also to help to define the eye shape as we get older um, our eye rims the muscles become weaker and we can kind of lose our shape so it can help um, strengthen the look of those lines around our eyes and make our eyes pop for blush uh, we're going to uh, apply the color to the apples of the cheeks blending outward toward the temples lip color we want to properly apply color um, properly ap applied color should be even and symmetrical on both sides of the mouth. It doesn't need to be too thick and look too heavy. You can blot with a tissue. Um, you know, the gloss should not look like it could drip off the lip. So make sure you're not using too much product. And if we apply mascara, um, you can use an eyelash curler. Some This is preference. Um, I have tried eyelash curlers, but I just never became a big fan. Um, but if you're going to use an eyelash curler, you're going to curl before you apply the mascara. And then you're going to apply the mascara so it coats the thinnest hairs of the inner and outer corner of the eyes. So be careful that you're not glopping on mascara. You know, if it's gotten too thick, you can start looking spidery. That means either it needs to be tossed or you need to warm it up a little bit to thin it out or do the eye drop trick that I talked about. Or maybe it's just old and it's time to go. Um, because your lashes should be separated looking. They should not be glomped together. Strip lashes. Excuse me. Lost my page. Um, these, um, you want to make sure you have the correct color and the correct length. Um, you're going to remove the strip lash. Be sure to use cotton pads that are saturated with makeup mover. And individual lashes, we call this lash tabbing. Um, and eyelash adhesives is, adhesive is used to make artificial lashes adhere, stick to the natural lash line. Make sure you're using a glue that's eye safe. I know I've heard of some people using hair glue. Um, just be careful. Um, they say it works better than the adhesive that comes with the strip lashes or the individuals. But always, if you're going to pursue this as a speciality in your career, make sure you get additional training. Make sure you are certified. Um, strip lashes are not meant to be worn for days and days and days. Remember, we talked about, you know, little mites and things that live on us and they live in our lashes, too. If you want to see what they look like, Google some uh, magnified pictures, and they love that lash glue. Even little tiny lice love that lash glue. So make sure that you are educating your client um, on how to be safe and sanitary when wearing these artificial lashes. So special occasion makeup. Uh, you can apply your base color from the lashes to the brow with a shadow or a brush. Um, you can see here how she's contoured to make um, the recessed area go, go back, whereas the lighter color is going to bring the lids forward and the highlighted on the brow. Here she's doing her eyeliner. Um, you know, you can use a powder to eyeline with too if it has enough pigment, if it's opaque enough. Um, so it's all preference. Um, and again, we want to have disposable supplies when we're doing clients. We can use a darker blush um, under the cheekbones to add definition. Uh, we want to apply with a blush brush and blend carefully. We can add a brighter, lighter cheek color to the apples and blend. Use a cheek color with shimmer or glitter. Um, again, if you're in a wedding, you're going to a dance, you know, some other special occasion, you know, you can be a little bit more blingy. You just don't want to look like you poured glitter all over your face. And these can come in cream or powder forms. Um, you want to line the lips, fill, the, uh, fill it with a lip pencil and blot, and then add lip color. 
And again, just that, like I spoke about, about earlier, to make the lips look fuller, you can put a, go a gloss in the center. So this is just kind of a quick overview, you know, some contouring, shadowing, highlighting, um, the basics of makeup, you know, in their different um, viscosities and forms and components they come in. Um, and we're going to practice this some on each other. So if you want to have your makeup done or if you want to do makeup on someone, bring your individual makeup because um, that way, you know, you're just dealing with your own germs, so to speak. 